Tiger snakes are one of the top five most poisonous snakes on earth. And to most Australians, they're just another deadly snake. But the tiger snake really is something special. And Rob Brettle tells us why. Rob Brettle has lived with snakes all his life. He looks at them no differently to any other animal. He thinks all you have to do to live with them is to get to know them. To most people, a snake is a long, thin creature, slimy, poisonous, crawls through the grass, and it just wants to bite people. The long and slender bit, that's true. But if they were put here just to bite people, they would all be the size of large anacondas. If I were a snake, I would be able to, without arms or legs, wriggle up this watermelon and swallow it whole. But I can't. I'm not a snake. How can they do this? Firstly, their skin can stretch to as thin as glad wrap. Now I've come here to the Queensland Museum to show you the skull of a snake. Now unlike us, most of the bones in the head of a snake are not fused together like us. So they can actually stretch apart and this allows the snake to consume animals much larger than their head. Now their teeth are needle sharp and they all face back to grip their prey and they can have more than a hundred of them. They can have from three to four hundred vertebrae with a set of ribs attached to each. Their skin is covered in scales which keeps in moisture, reflects and absorbs heat and their internal organs to fit in are stretched out and they're just identical to ours. They have a lung, a heart, a liver, kidneys. If you do live in an area with a lot of snakes and they worry you, there is a simple way to identify a venomous from a non-venomous snake and I'll show it to you. All pythons have narrow belly scales. If you look on his belly you'll notice they're only about that wide. And only pythons have narrow belly scales. No other snake has it. All tree snakes are long and thin and they have a large scale that looks like a fingernail that runs down the centre of their back, right down the middle of their back there. Now the venomous snakes, their belly scales go right across the snake and they have large uniform scales across their back, all the same size. And I might just add, if you're going to do this, do it with a dead snake, one you found run over on the road preferably. Australia is the land of the poisonous snake. Interestingly, they have all probably evolved from a single species that drifted here from Asia some 15 million years ago. Now the tough conditions here created tough snakes. We have more species of venomous snake than anywhere else. When Australia finally drifted up from Gondwana land around 50 million years ago, it was the beginning of a unique and lonely voyage. For perhaps 20 million years, it remained isolated and free from intrusion. This drifting landmass became a kind of laboratory experimenting in evolution, where life forms quite different from the rest of the world roamed. Then, around 20 million years ago, things began to change. Australia bumped into the Asian landmass. Now a small wave of new animal species began filtering down. They arrived to find a very different land full of strange plants and animals. Many perished, but a few survived, including a handful of snakes. Snakes are well equipped to be migrants. They float, have waterproof skins, and can do without food and water for long periods. Once on land, all they need to do is eat what comes along. Just like this snake here, floating in on a piece of driftwood, many families of snakes would have made their way to Australia from Asia, possibly flushed out of some prehistoric river 
by some great flood. Of the snakes to successfully colonise the northern Australian shores so long ago, only one was poisonous. It enjoyed the tough new conditions and by changing over time, spread and adapted to every part of this new homeland. Today, Australia has more types of poisonous snakes than any other country. But this is not the end of the story, because even as I speak, off the southern coast of Australia, the common tiger snakes are rapidly spawning new species. These are what we call the island tigers. Island tiger snakes are snakes with a difference. They're found on a number of small islands off Australia's southern coastline. These castaways have been stranded here since the finish of the last ice age. Here they make a good living, and they do it in a quite unexpected way. But their story starts on the mainland with one of Australia's most familiar snakes, the common tiger snake. To look at, a tiger snake is just another average Australian snake. Sure, they're one of the most deadly, and they have killed a lot of people, but then so have a lot of other snakes. They come in a wide range of colours, they have live young, but then so do a lot of other snakes. I suppose the most amazing thing is this, the way those characteristics have combined so this snake can survive where no other can. Now, one other thing, they are not fussy eaters. They will eat anything that moves. And that's why I'm standing very still. Yeah, common tiger snake. Yeah, there's nothing very common about the story this fella has to tell. Beauty. Rob Breddle is searching in the wetland home of the tiger snake in southern Australia. Now that was a bloody tiger snake. Bit too warm, eh? Common tiger snakes are frog eaters and love the swamps. They thrive in these cool, wet areas and best time to see them is early morning. Oops. It's then they come out of That's the reeds to warm in the sun. When you look at this amazing snake, you just have to wonder why. It does just as well on a cold, waterless island as it does on the edge of this freshwater swamp. Or even why it has such deadly venom. It's in fact the fourth most deadly snake in the world. Common tiger snakes are widespread over southeastern Australia and are found where there are frogs. They do best along the river systems and adjacent swamps in conditions most other snakes avoid. The trademark stripes sometimes give way to plain brown or black. This colour variation is very important it helps them to penetrate colder regions totally unsuitable for most other snake species. Weeks have passed since the hot, dry summer of southern Australia has replaced the cold and wet winter. Streams and swamps are full, and the tiger snakes are active. While snakes need the sun to increase their body temperature, they can choose what temperature they need for a particular activity. The choice at this time of the year is to allow their bodies to warm to around 30 degrees. At this temperature, the tiger snake is ready to hunt and eat. By now, frogs also have taken advantage of the warmth and water and are breeding prolifically. They're easy prey compared with rats, mice, birds and other reptiles that frequent the swamp. The tiger snake smells the frog by tasting the air and ground with its tongue. This is what the tiger snake has been hunting for millions of years. Its calm, unwavering pursuit oozes confidence. 
there have always been plenty of frogs, and they're less dangerous to catch than rats and mice. The common tiger snake might prefer frogs, but it's not fussy. If something like a mouse or lizard comes along, it'll eat that too. Easy-going tiger snakes don't go hungry too often. Tiger snakes mate for most of the year if the conditions are warm enough. They give birth to fully developed young instead of laying eggs. The male tries to pin down the female to stop her from moving and persuade her to mate with him. It's the smell of the female rather than her action that triggers the male's enthusiasm. The ritual can go on intermittently for days. She may mate several times with different partners over a period of months, but she ovulates only once each year, and this is always in spring. It's late summer, and a female tiger snake, cobra-like, spreads and flattens her body to absorb the sun's warmth. The heat of the sun is critical to the development of her soon-to-be-born young. Most of southern Australia is parched and dry by now. Rivers and swamps are low, and the annual frog feast is not long to run. It's as if the Corellas are giving harsh warnings that the cold, wet months of winter are near. The closer to winter the young are born, the less chance there is for survival. Sometime later, on this summer day, the female tiger snake looks for shelter. She's going to give birth. Most Australian snakes are egg layers, but live birthing has special advantages for the tiger snake. It allows the young to survive the cold and occasional flooding of their watery habitat. This is the one feature that allows the tiger snakes to thrive in the cold swamps. As soon as they're born, they scatter to hide and to hunt. While the young are drown-proof and endure the winter cold, their chances of survival are still remote. They're prey for just about everything that lives in and around the waterways. The mammal's lengthy nurturing period for their young doesn't work for snakes. What does is the production of masses of fully functioning miniatures scattering and ready to fend for themselves. They're equipped with all they need to survive from the moment they're born. Survival means keeping away from everything, even their brothers and sisters. When two babies randomly cross paths, pure instinct triggers an instant reaction. Because snakes are immune to their own venom, the only way this baby can win is by holding on for dear life to stop the other breathing. Success is unlikely. Baby tigers love to eat baby frogs, but the right-sized skinks will do just as well. By this time of the season, there are plenty about, and they often hide in the same places as baby tiger snakes. By luck, more than by good management, a young snake has its first and most important meal. As winter approaches, at least one of this latest generation of common tiger snakes has improved its prospects. For another though, its luck is about to run out. While skinks are good baby food, the small frogs in the swamps remain as their major food supply. And where there are small frogs, there are big frogs. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, the tiger snake's main meal becomes a lethal threat as the prey turns predator. The green and golden bell frog seizes the opportunity. A lot of tiger snakes faced a bit of a problem about 9,000 years ago. The sea levels rose and swallowed up their swamps and rivers. When the sea rose, it was a repeat of many such previous events. Oscillating temperatures were characteristic of an ice age lasting millions of years. It was this time of fluctuating temperatures and sea levels that saw the emergence of the human race, as well as the tiger snakes. It seems that both humans and tiger snakes are products of the Ice Age. Tiger snakes adapted to a seesawing climate with live birthing and colour change, but a hundred metre rise in the ocean level was a quite different matter. With the change, animals, including tiger snakes, either stranded on newly formed islands or retreated to new and unfamiliar territory. Many of these now fragmented populations had to adapt or die. Some tiger snakes were forced into the arid lands already populated by other species. There was just no room for the newcomer. The sluggish frog eater was no match for its more agile, better adapted cousins. Even worse, there were no frogs for the young, so the tiger just disappeared. But a number of groups did adapt and survive, and now these are our newest poisonous snakes. Now this is an interesting little fellow, the Kraft's tiger snake. By rights he shouldn't even be here, it's too dry. Now he was lost for a long time, but my father and I rediscovered him in 1962. Kreft's tiger snake is so rare that very few people even know about them, let alone have seen one. Smaller and darker than the common tiger, it's still a frog eater and highly venomous. Mainly confined to a couple of deep valleys in the Flinders Ranges, it's managed to adapt to the special conditions. These are difficult, but a couple of small modifications enable Kreft's tiger snake to survive. This Valley of the Tigers remains a kind of oasis cut off by sea and dry agricultural land. The mountains collect enough moisture to form small creeks. It's here that the frogs still do well, and so do Kreft's tiger snakes. The steep valleys have their own special climate. Sunlight only enters them near the middle of the day. Only when the sun reaches the valley floor can snakes begin to raise their body temperature for the all-important hunt. But the main food for the Kreft's tiger snakes at this time of the year is not so much the frogs, but tadpoles. Tadpole time is feast time.
By midsummer, large numbers build up in the shallow pools, and this is why it survives. This adult Kreft's tiger snake has been in the water hunting for tadpoles for some time. They're everywhere now and hard to ignore. After all, the feast is short-lived in the valley and comes around only once a year. The snake doesn't want to stop, but its body temperature has dropped too low in the cold water. Low water temperature rapidly depletes the snake's energy reserves. It needs to leave and reheat in the sun. The black colouring allows this to happen in the shortest possible time. Further along the creek, a juvenile Kreft's tiger snake soaks up the warmth before entering the cold water. Yet to change to its mostly black adult colouring, the stripes remind us of the close relationship to the common tiger snake. For the young snake, it's a daily race against time. On entering the water, its body temperature begins to fall rapidly, so there's an urgent need to catch and eat as many tadpoles as possible. The snake's amazing sense of smell works just as well underwater as on the surface. The head has become slightly smaller and more chiselled compared with its common ancestor to allow easier movement under the rocks where the tadpoles hide. As the day progresses, the young snake will balance its time between hunting in the water and basking in the sun. When the sun disappears from the valley, the day's hunting will finish. The Kreft's tiger snake truly lives on the edge. Cornered in a couple of amazingly small valleys, there's no way out through the nearly waterless surrounds. Daily feeding opportunities are brief and depend almost entirely on a single and vulnerable food source. Kreft's gamble on the boom of an annual frog explosion at a time when frogs worldwide are simply disappearing. If the frogs disappear, the adults can eat mice and other small mammals. But the babies need frogs to survive. Because the water is so cold, it's only worthwhile hunting tadpoles when there are plenty of them. So if the annual horde of tadpoles were to disappear, it's likely the snake will too. I reckon one of the key factors in the tiger snake's ability to adapt is its amazing variation in colour. Ooh. If they're coming brown, black, striped, wide stripes, narrow stripes, if the colour fits, it wears it. Only on a handful of islands off the coast of southern Australia do we see how important colour is to the tiger snake. Almost without exception, they will be black, and it is a tiger. Our guide to the islands of black tigers is Peter Merchant. He's been watching the snakes out there on the Sir Joseph Banks group for more than 20 years. A couple of mates who've been fishing around the islands for even longer take us over. What's the venture? You're going to catch it. Ten thousand years ago, there was no water here, and to get where I'm going to go, I'd have had to walk for the best part of a day. I'd been heading for a little group of hills. Today, 
they have to go by boat. And those little group of hills have become a series of islands. Since the water rose, the tops of those hills have become waterless islands. And they're the habitat of an unusual tiger snake. The first island we land at is Reevesby, a sandy hump a few kilometres long and not much more than a ball throw wide. There seems little indication of the profusion of life we've come to see, but we know that it's teeming with tiger snakes and thousands of seabirds called white-faced storm petrels. They're here, but most of the activity is underground. Thousands of baby petrels wait in their burrows for the return of their parents. It'll be well after dark when they arrive to feed their young. For most of the daytime, the chicks' only company is the scavenging crickets. But often, a visitor of quite different intent comes slithering into the cool, dark burrows. Each year, the return of petrels for their breeding season signals the beginning of the great annual tiger feast. In an extraordinary turnaround, the frog-eating, swamp-loving tiger snake has adapted to living in dry, sandy burrows and to hunting small seabirds. All they have to eat are these white-faced storm petrels that are only present for a few months each year. To make the most of this short annual feast, they've made changes. The black colour allows the snake to heat more rapidly, therefore hunt sooner and digest more food. Stronger venom breaks down tissue faster, further increasing the rate of food intake. Yeah, someone would have dropped me on this island a while ago. I mean when I was a kid, and said, you're going to find some tiger snakes here, I laughed at them. It's barren, waterless and dry. And where I come from, tiger snakes live in swamps, freshwater swamps. The best time to see these black tiger snakes on the surface, they call them peninsula tiger snakes, is on cool sunny days. This is when they can stay longer in the baking sun. If I could take myself back a few thousand years, I'd be walking on top of a hill, and down there would be a valley. And in the bottom of that valley, there'd be lakes and swamps. And the tiger snakes there would be chasing frogs around these freshwater swamps. Today, the top of this hill is an island and there is no water. It's a bit like a dry swamp in the middle of an ocean of unusable water. And the tiger snakes that live here have had to make a few changes. They've had to live without water, change their diet, and they've changed their colour. The thing you've got to know about these tiger snakes are they're big, they're black, and they're poisonous. They might be big, black, and poisonous, but Rob Breddle finds that compared with their mainland cousins, they're pussycats. They're king of the island, not used to being chased by anything. An all-round couch potato of the snake world.
There's another snake that shares this island with the tigers, and it's a master of camouflage. I've just found one. It's a death adder. See if you can spot him. Now these are interesting little snakes and actually hunt with their tails. So he's probably been sitting here for a week or more waiting for a, a lizard to come along and bite his tail. They wriggle their tail like a grub. He's just noticed that I'm here. Let's lift it up for you so you can see the little snake. He might even come. There he comes, look at that. If there'd have been a lizard there, it would have got it. He really doesn't know what's happened. Death adders tell us something very important. They help explain how baby tiger snakes grow big enough to eat petrels. They eat the same small lizards as the death adder. It looks like it was positively taken by a snake because the head looks like it's decomposing faster from the action of the venom. And they usually try to eat them head first. On this cool sunny morning, the snakes seem to be everywhere. They're soaking up the warmth to digest their food and hunt for more. They need to eat as much as they can before the end of the petrel's breeding season. Once the sun and sand get too hot, then the snakes return to the cooler burrows. Rob Brettle is looking to see how big the young petrels have grown by this time in the season. That's not a chick. There's a snake down there. Here we've got a dead one. And it just shows you how dry it is here. It didn't rot, it mummified. Pretty tough environment. This little ball of fluff here, with the feathers sticking out, is the main reason why the island tiger snakes do so well here. It's a white-faced storm petrel and they nest here in their thousands. Both the young and the parents are eaten and it's lucky for the tiger snake they're here. We better put him back I think. The tigers of Reevesby Island have adapted well to their waterless world. They now have a better venom than their common tiger ancestor and black colouring. All this adds up to faster meals. Now they eat just about as much as their mainland cousins, but they do it in a much shorter time. To see how well the Reevesby Island population is doing, Rob Riddle catches a few snakes for closer examination. You didn't strike at that bloody thing. Now that's a little bit savage, isn't it? Stumpy tail one too, he is. Is he? Angry. I'll just move him out to the open here. Okay. Oh, missed you. That's the liveliest one I've ever come across. Now they're pretty prolific on these islands because while I'm catching this one, there's another one just over to our right. Rob's hoping to find gravid females. They should be just about ready to give birth. A sure sign of a healthy population. <laughs> now that's a beauty. This is a real beauty. This is a pregnant female. You can see the babies in the belly here. You can see lump, lump, lump all the way down where my fingers are going. 
big pregnant female. I would never have guessed that any snakes would live here, but they do. This tiny speck of an island is the land of the pygmies. Those amazing tiger snakes. To live here, they just downsized. Early one morning, our fishermen friends drop us over to Roxby Island. Only a few kilometres from Reevesby Island, there are no nesting seabirds here, but there are plenty of small lizards and tiger snakes. We made it. Okay. Now this is Roxby, eh? Roxby. Here on Roxby Island, the tiger snakes got the rough end of the pineapple. They were stranded on an island with only lizards for food. Small prey, small snake. When we first visited Roxby Islands, we saw roughly about two dozen tiger snakes and they're all around about the same size. And we were rather surprised about the size because it was very small. But it probably wasn't until some time after when we'd seen tiger snakes from a number of the adjacent islands that we realised that these tiger snakes were actually probably the smallest tiger snakes of all tiger snakes. Here's one, Robbie. <laughs> Let's drag him out. Is that about an adult size? Yeah, it's what I try and drag it out of here. This is the smallest tiger snake there is. It's, it's smaller because uh, it only eats small food like little skinks, like those striped skinks and uh, the odd small bird like the silver eyes. No petrels here on uh, Roxby Island. So basically it's the same as the other tiger snakes on the other islands but it's just smaller. Yeah, that's right. The truth of the matter is, without these little fellows, the skinks, none of the island tiger snakes would survive. It is the food of their young. Here on Chapel Island, to eat birds this big, they've become giants. They're the biggest tiger snake in the world. The rising sea levels that created Reevesby and many other islands along the Australian coastline also created Tasmania. Before this, the area we call Bass Strait contained a huge lake. As the climate warmed, rainfall increased and life around and in the lake would have proliferated. Undoubtedly, it became a haven for animals of many types, including birds, frogs and tiger snakes. For a time, it would have been a veritable Garden of Eden, but the sea continued to rise. When the sea levels rose between the Australian mainland and Tasmania to form Bass Strait, a lot of animals, including the common tiger snakes, would have been forced to high ground, including a few newly formed islands. Life remained fairly normal for those stranded on the larger islands, but the barefoot bushman travels to a mere pinprick on the map called Mount Chapel Island. It seems impossible that any snakes could survive in such a desolate place. But not only do they survive, there are thousands of tiger snakes, and they grow larger here than anywhere else. The peaceful beauty of the island masks one of the most extraordinary episodes in the life of the tiger snake, and it all happens under the ground. Rod Breddle is searching for the one small creature that makes it all possible. The trick is to find a burrow without a tiger snake.
Mount Chapel Island is a major nesting site for the short-tailed shearwater or mutton bird, and the tiger snakes have grown large enough to eat them. These birds are much bigger than the white-faced storm petrels relished by the black tigers on Reevesby Island. Except the small lizards, there's nothing else to eat on Chapel Island but mutton birds. So the tiger snakes here had to overcome a bigger problem than most of the other island tigers. The birds are so large that they can only eat the chicks until they reach a certain size. They can't eat the adults. So for the Chapel Island tigers, the chicken feast only lasts for a short time. This is the adult mutton bird. And by sheer luck for the tiger snake, it chose to nest here on these islands. In its migration, it travels from here to Russia and back. And in its life, will fly 36 times around the world. Okay. Like thousands of other birds, this bird's chick was probably eaten by a tiger snake. A short walk around the island tells Rob Breddle that the snakes are thriving. They're virtually everywhere. Like the black tigers on Reevesby Island, they come out of the mutton bird burrows when the temperature is right to hunt and to absorb the warmth of the sun and sand. Their placid behaviour tells us they're kings of the island, top of the food chain with nothing to fear but we humans. What a beauty, eh? Get me too, wouldn't you? Like get his fangs into you, wouldn't he? By sunrise, most of the adult mutton birds are out at sea. They will not return to their young before dark. The chicks are now quite large, and the once a year opportunity for the tiger snakes to build their reserves is nearly over. It's at this time of the year that the relationship between the tigers and the chicks makes a strange transformation. Predator and prey become unlikely nest mates. The tiger snakes now cuddle up to the chicks, too large to eat. But there's still food around, and the hunt continues. While life is tough for most of the year on Mount Chapel Island, for a few short weeks it's tiger snake heaven. Just about every hole will have one huge feed of the best possible tucker just sitting there waiting to be eaten. The struggle to swallow its meal may go on for hours as the snake stretches its jaws and body to the limit. Almost certainly this will be the last feed for this snake until the next nesting season, in nearly a year. In only a few thousand years, the Chapel Island tiger snake has become thicker and longer than its ancestral common tiger snake. And year by year, infinitely slowly, it'll continue to increase its size to eat more mutton birds for longer during their nesting season. The common tiger snake has spawned our newest venomous snakes, the island tigers. 
Deprived of the swamps and frogs, they adapted rapidly to change and survived the odds against them. This is what snakes are about. By looking at the tiger snakes, we gain insight into the extraordinary world of snakes and see just how well they're doing. Throughout the planet, there are now more than 2,000 species adapted to almost every available habitat and consuming just about any animal. An amazing feat for a legless, armless and deaf creature. The island tiger snakes are just the latest stage in 15 to 20 million years of evolution that began on the northern shores of Australia and continue today on its southern fringe. While their mainland ancestors falter in the face of rapid man-made destruction of their swampy playgrounds, the island tiger snakes continue as they have for the last eight to 10,000 years. By altering just a few things, they are coping well with the changes caused by the rising sea levels and are thriving in their isolation. It is there on those islands, I believe, we are witness to the start of a brand new species.